This is Twit. AMD Radeon 7 uh, announced at CES. Kind of a surprise for me that we were, I was thinking we would get hardcore Ryzen, you know, 3000 news and maybe some light. This is the future of, of the AMD uh, GPU platform. Uh, I had it completely backwards. There was a whole lot of AMD 7 and the mention of 7, 7 nanometer, and anywhere uh, Dr. Sue could mention 7. Uh, especially uh, in reference to nanometer and process, just to kind of dig a fork, uh, I think, in Intel uh, and probably NVIDIA. Um, certainly based on some of the reactions we saw at NVIDIA, not something they expected to be announced at CES. Uh, and, you know, not that I don't love the 2060, but this was a pretty big announcement compared to the 2060. You, I didn't expect cards to show up this fast was this kind of a surprise or did, did you leave uh, with a card at ces or can you no, talk no. about no. this okay oh yeah i mean the the card is behind me they shipped these out uh like all the reviewers kits that came on these nice acrylic stands with uh, led lighting were shipped out after the fact i didn't have mine until about a week before this release i think uh -huh. and so it's kind of a blur i don't really remember days anymore but the, yeah, like you said, it was a surprise. I was expecting, we were list, we were hearing rumors about new processors. We were thinking it was going to be Zen 2, like Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. And I was like, to the point where I was creating tables based on like leaked specs so I could have stuff ready for the news post. And I'm watching the keynote and then this comes out. So, and Lisa was talking about the move to seven nanometer and I'm like wondering, is this like new graphics architecture? What is going on here? <laughs> and you know, the, and the, the thing that we maybe would have expected is maybe like a high end graphics solution coming later on and we would see the CPUs first, but it's obviously, like you said, it's flip flop, like the opposite is what happened here. Right. But this is still a really interesting product. Like architecturally for those that follow such things, this is, not breaking new ground. There's not a bunch of new graphical features, that sort of thing. What this is, is is optimized, refined, and as they say, supercharged Vega. So the Vega 10 core was the thing that powered their previous high-end graphics, the RX Vega 64, and uh, like workstation graphics like the Radeon Frontier Edition. And what Radeon 7 is, is it's basically the consumer version of they have a line of products called instinct the radeon instinct products of like their workstation mm -hmm. compute cards so this is based on the same vega 20 core found in the instinct mi50 workstation card so what this is actually fewer compute units are enabled on this versus vega 64 which surprised me at the beginning. So you have fewer stream processors, 3,840 3, enabled uh, versus the full 4,096. Mm -hmm. And so I, at the outset, just looking over the specs, I'm thinking, uh, is it just clock? So, they, the, so the move down to 7 nanometer would allow them to shrink the die. It shrunk considerably from 495 millimeters squared down to 331 millimeters squared. And the extra space on that interposer on this chip is now filled with two additional stacks of four gigabytes of HBM2 memory, the high bandwidth memory. Whoa. And that was the big change because when you add stacks of HBM2 on this architecture, they're adding memory controllers. So it went from two memory controllers to four memory controllers, which literally doubles the memory bandwidth. And then they actually boosted the memory speed as well. So slightly faster memory. So we go from a little under 500 gigabytes per second total bandwidth with Vega 64 to a terabyte of memory bandwidth with Vega or with Vega 20 and of course the Radeon 7. So just wow. if there was any bottleneck at all to Vega before, I can imagine that it's it's got to be gone. So not only <laughs> do you have just ridiculous amounts of bandwidth, but you have more graphics memory, more frame buffer than we've ever seen right. from a consumer graphics card at 16 gigabytes. So just all sorts of questions about what the performance would be like. Obviously, uh, AMD 
allowed reviewers to sort of tease the card, show pictures of the card, or unbox the card back on the 4th, but we couldn't share any performance numbers until today. And so uh, I, I spent a day with the card at, at 2560 by 1440, and I spent a day with it running 4K tests. And basically right off the bat, what I was seeing was performance right in between an RTX 2070 and an RTX 2080, with the 2080 <laughs> still having a pretty healthy lead with synthetic benchmarks anyway. And as I moved on to gaming, That's... I thought, go ahead. No, I was going to say that. That would explain uh, some of the NVIDIA reaction at CES, which uh, a friend of mine referred to as like, wow, that was quite a tantrum, one of the public postings that came out. Uh, that's a huge jump in terms of AMD performance. Now, you know, this isn't an inexpensive card, but neither of, neither are the, the 2070 or the 2080. Uh, and it, it's, it's like in one fell product jump, they've gone from sort of middle of the pack to awfully close to the fastest card you can buy today. That's a yeah. huge jump. I mean, if you look at, obviously, I didn't do any testing with the 2080 Ti because that's just in another like stratosphere of cost sure. uh, at $1,000. The RTX 2080 and this Radeon 7 are both $699 cards. And while AMD is offsetting the cost, as, as GPU makers will do, with a, a game bundle, and there are three like top tier games that's worth $180 to kind of subsidize mm -hmm. that price. There is absolutely s still a bit of a uh, pricing issue with this if you're just looking at the raw performance. And if, if you read the review and go through all the charts, what you'll see is for AMD optimized games, mm -hmm. like Far Cry 5, like Ashes of the Singularity Escalation, this is right up there trading blows with the 2080. Like uh, in Far Cry 5, like one of my tests, I think I had it out on top. It depends on resolution. Like 4K, it was like in second place or, you know, 1440, it might be in first versus second. But in those games, it's right up there. So you have to think like a, a certain amount of its potential performance is going to be how well optimized the software is to take advantage of this particular kind of hardware like this is unusual hardware that you know it's having this much memory and having this much memory bandwidth uh, this is significantly different from how you could handle things like high resolution textures and yeah. higher resolutions and things so they, there there is more room to push this card than i was even able to test even at 4k because my 4k testing is at pretty modest settings like standard normal preset settings, nothing high. And it was still a little bit better overall at 4K than it was at 1440. So then I have to wonder, like, what if I enable all, like, optional HD textures, uh, push the resolution even higher? NVIDIA and AMD both have this technology. Uh, DSR is what it's called on the NVIDIA side, and uh, ASR, I think, on the AMD side. It's... <laughs> it's um, basically oversampling, like you render off screen at a higher resolution than your monitor can actually handle. And then it's it's basically downsampled at the display engine level to your monitor. So you end up with like an entire screen uh, anti-aliasing sort of effect. It's basically what Apple does with their retina displays on Macs. So you can Got do it. that with these graphics cards in certain supported games but you run into a wall with video memory very fast. So that's one of the things that they had talked about was you can do that. You can do dynamic resolution and actually avoid hitting the eight gigabyte wall that you would get with the NVIDIA card at the same price. So they're, they're kind of looking for ways, it seems, on the, on the gaming side to make use of this much frame buffer, which is just an unprecedented amount of memory, like I said. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you're more constrained by the power of the GPU than you are the amount of memory that you have. And that's right. when the whole uh, content creation side of this really makes that amount of, of memory more interesting. So while the gaming picture is kind of like it's right in between a 2070 and a 2080, depending on whether the game is optimized for AMD or not, the... Mm -hmm 
content creation side is just, it's clear. Like this for OpenCL compute is significantly faster than what we saw with Vega 64. And that's a combination of the optimizations, obviously the increased memory bandwidth, but also this is so much more aggressively clocked than what we saw with Vega 64. Like this has mm -hmm. a peak uh, frequency of 1800 megahertz, depending on the workload and a boost clock speed of 1750. And the cooler on this card, this triple fan cooler is extremely efficient. It favors thermals over noise, certainly. It's not a really loud card because it's not a blower style card, but it still moves a lot of air and you can hear it. And my testing, I never saw in any temperature over 60 degrees at load. So you have a lot of headroom and they were showing gains like the, the gains in Luxmark, like the Luxball uh, HDR uh, rendering test, huge, huge gains and, you know, appreciable, like significant gains in other tests as well. And they, they were using uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, like uh, Premiere, as an example, how you could edit 8K video where you're easily creating situations where you might eclipse 8. 10, 11 gigabytes of video memory. And this significantly speeds up the process because you're not running out of RAM while you're rendering. So uh, on the workstation side, this is a very interesting product because you're essentially getting a consumer version of the Instinct MI50, which is a $1,000 card. The right. only real difference is certain features are disabled and actually of interest that MI50 and MI60, based on the Vega 20 core, Vega 20 is actually a PCI Express 4 uh, platform. So Instinct is PCI Express uh, 4.0, and this is only like 3.0 enabled. I don't know how much more benefit you might get from a move up to PCI Gen 4, but mm -hmm. that's that's one difference. And obviously, the, you don't lack professional drivers for this, and they have they have reduced the FP64, uh, like the double precision uh, performance of this. So for those, uh, you know, workstation workflows that require the use of ECC memory and double precision compute, you're getting a reduced amount with this. Although actually, the amount that they, they settled on, which didn't even happen until I think yesterday or today, is more than four times what it was originally going to be. It was going to be like a 16th of uh, full percentage, full precision and now it's up to like a quarter. So still hmm. very across the board, excellent compute numbers. And certainly this could be used to accelerate, you know, video editing and rendering in addition to being right in the conversation with some of the fastest gaming graphics cards you can buy. And really the only issue is price for from a gaming standpoint because the 2080 is 699 the 2070 is 499 the performance of this card is right between those on average mm -hmm. and the but the price is not so if this was 599 i'd be having the same conversation i had about the rtx 2060 where i'm like this is priced exactly where it should be relative to its performance and this is slightly above that. But I, I mean, I understand some of the reasoning. Obviously, they, they like to make money. I, I would hope they're making money on this product. But this, this is a lot of memory. This is a lot of HBM2. And this is basically, a, a, I would imagine, in the move to 7 nanometer because it is so young. Like, they have not been on 7 nanometer for very long. This is their first GPU product, Vega 20. Uh, and a member of our staff, Josh, who is uh, much more in tune with processor and graphics architecture than I am, he referred to this kind of as like a pipe cleaner. Like when they go to a new process, they will use an existing architecture to kind of work out the bugs and and move like to to get to a point where they have higher yields and they learn as they go. So the next architecture will be the one that's like completely different and we will have like a new set of graphics features and things. So right now what we essentially have, like uh, AMD had said, is this is basically supercharged Vega. It's the same core architecture, but less latency, higher bandwidth, much more aggressive clock speeds enabled by the move to seven nanometer within the same 
uh, board power limit. Like this is still a 300 watt card. This is still going to require two eight pin connectors and a and a beefy power supply. But it's got the cooling power to to keep this well within thermal limits with the stock cooler. And we have not heard of any like third party designs or anything yet. This is this is the card. And then my like the the final point I guess is just availability where what I'm kind of seeing today as I poke around the internet is there's really not availability for this card yet. So we will see. I don't think this was a paper launch, but I'm not sure where stock is currently. 